I'm Taylor Jones. I'm the New York Speakers Advocate with Wild Earth Guardians, and thank you so much for coming out to our presentation on prairie dogs. Um, just a couple of announcements. There's refreshments in the back. If you didn't see, we have coffee, tea, and fresh veggies. We're also selling raffle tickets for a variety of awesome prizes. We have these two beautiful art prints. There is a pass to Mountain Film and two bottles of wine and two necklaces. So if you guys want to throw down $5 a ticket for a chance to win any of these awesome prizes, the, the raffle tickets are being sold right outside the door. And all the funds raised will go to benefit our wildlife program. Um, the drawing for the raffle is going to happen when Rich Reading has finished his talk, but before we show our documentary. Um, the documentary film is about an hour, and it's called Prairie Dogs Speaking Their Language, and it features the research of Khan Slobachikov, who's been studying prairie dog communication for about 30 years. It's a really nice film produced by BBC. And so first up, let me introduce you guys to Rich Reading. Rich. at Yale. He's, he studied prairie dogs and ferrets and he's continued to study them for over 25 years. He's done a lot of research in both the social sciences and in ecology. And he's the vice president for the field conservation department at the Denver Zoo. And take it away, Rich. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me up here. Um, I appreciate it. I'm actually going to, I'm, I'm, I'm having two duties today. Um, I'm very sad to say that Dr. Anna Davidson um, could not make it tonight. She had a family emergency. So I've agreed to uh, do what I can with, with her talk. I actually just got it about, um, oh, about maybe an hour and 15 minutes ago. So uh, I'm going to do my best, but I, I'm sure it's, it's going to be nowhere near as, as good as it would have been had she been here. I know, I know Anna really well, as well as Khan, and she's, she's a great person, a great researcher. Um, she's been studying prairie dogs for quite a while herself. Um, she's now uh, studying prairie dogs in New Mexico and also right across the border in, in Mexico, a place called Hanos. And she's gonna, her talk covers that a little bit. I'm going to talk about that, I guess. She's uh, affiliated with both the University of New Mexico and the National University of Mexico, um, UNAM. So without further ado, I'm going I'm to hop in there a little bit. And what her talk is going to primarily be is the importance of prairie dogs in grassland ecosystems. I'm going to cover this a little bit as well, so hopefully the duplication will not uh, bore you too much. My take will be slightly different perhaps, but I'll cover a lot of the same things. But, but really, um, what I think one of the points she wants to make is that it's not just prairie dogs, but there are a number of these social herbivorous, which means plant-eating uh, rodents or small mammals that act as keystone species on grassland systems throughout the world. And, um, they, they influence animals in a variety of ways, as, as she illustrates here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the slide, but, but things eat them, of course. They, they clip and, and eat the grass, which then has a whole bunch of other effects. Don't worry too much about all the details. They also build mounds, and so they alter the ecosystem that other um, animals benefit from by using that altered system. So some species, like black-footed ferrets, um, critically endangered, use those burrows to live in. So that's the only thing they den in. Similarly, burrowing owls, um, many, many of you might know those, they preferentially use holes. They can actually dig their own hole, but, but you'll find that about, especially in the West, about 95% of the burrowing owls we have will use the burrows of other burrowing species. And in particular, they really like prairie dog burrows. They're just about the right size. So there's that kind of thing. Again, the way they, they alter grass, I'll talk about um, how the prairie dogs, by clipping the vegetation, actually increase the quality of the forage, so uh, while you see less grass on a prairie dog colony, it's important to realize that the quality of that grass is much higher, so that the impact to the carrying capacity at land is much, much less than, than we thought. So um, let me move on. As I mentioned, there's a, these are similar species throughout the world. I do a lot of work um, in Mongolia, and you can see up there Siberian marmots. They live in colonies, as, as you may or may not know, marmots are in the same family as prairie dogs. And they live in, in Mongolia. They live, there's a species that lives on the grasslands like 
prairie dogs. So they are the ecological equivalent. They live in big colonies. They have burrows, uh, big extensive grasslands, much like the grasslands we have in Colorado, and a lot of other species. We're doing research to quantify it, but we're finding very, very similar things that we found with black-tailed prairie dogs and um, Denison's prairie dogs in the United States, that they are ecosystem engineers. They are keystone species, and we call them ecosystem engineers because they change their environment, like beavers. A beaver's an ecosystem engineer, it makes a pond. An elephant's an ecosystem engineer, it knocks down trees. Prairie dogs are ecosystem engineers. They build burrows, they move a lot of soil, and they clip grass. Um, but there are things all over the world. Um, batongs in, in Australia, um, Cape ground squirrels and spring hares in Africa, the scotches, um, dagoos, and things like that in, in South America. And what you find is that throughout the world, these species are persecuted for the same reason that prairie dogs are persecuted. People think that they compete with their livestock. And, and we'll talk a little bit about whether or not that's really the case. Um, so what, what kind of things do, do these burrowing mammals do? Well, one thing they do is they create these unique habitat patches. So what we find is that the diversity across the landscape is much higher because some species like these habitat patches. Some species, it's true, prefer this kind of habitat. But what happens um, in today's day and age when we graze livestock across the landscape, most producers will tell you that what they're doing is they're, they're growing grass and they're managing for pretty much an, an even grass um, cover. They like a nice even grass cover. And so what that means for the species that live out there is that only those species that can survive in that kind of habitat do very well. The species that like a lot of grass don't do very well. And the species that like very, very little grass don't do very well. So what we've done unintentionally is we've created a, pretty much a monoculture out there for the other species of, of plants and animals that live on, on, the, um, on, the, on the ground. So um, again, you can look at these at different scales. I think that's what, that's what she's pointing out here. You can look at it across the landscape, like I mentioned. But even within the, within the prairie dog colony itself, you'll find patches. So that colony has areas with burrows. And you'll notice when you look at the colonies right here in, um, in Telluride, that those burrows have a lot of bare, bare ground on them. Very, very different than when you move off the burrow. And even what you'll, another thing you'll find is that there's even concentric zones in a prairie dog colony, depending how long the prairie dogs have lived there. And that has led to um, studies looking at the differences within a colony. And we find, indeed, the older part of the colonies have a different assemblage of plants and even invertebrates than the older part of the colonies. The library is going to close in 10 minutes. The going to close in 10 minutes, but you guys can stay. <laughs> Um, so I think, um, I think what she's getting at here is she's going to talk a little bit more about this area right over here, how their, their herbivory um, really influences the system and, and, um, and helps a, a variety of other species. And so there are really um, two main groups of, of um, species that, that influence the grasslands. There's the large grazers and the small grazers. And there's really three main processes that really dictate what we find on grassland systems. One is the drought, the periodicity of drought. And with, with climate change, we'll talk about that, that periodicity is changing. A second is the role of fire, which we've largely constrained. And the third is grazing. And with grazing, we have these large ungulates like elephants and wild horses in Mongolia, bison in North America, um, things like wanakos and dogs, um, rats, and, and marmots. So both those groups of animals have an impact on that grass, and, and, the, and the system evolved with this kind of double um, suite of, of, of herbivores. So what we have are, are grasslands throughout the world that when, when grasslands first came into being, um, and they really started to dominate the world about 30 million years ago, what we started to get is, is different species having different impacts and altering the landscape in a way that really has, has led to a cascade of other effects for other species. So um, when we're talking about North America, let's zoom back in. Um, what you find are, are the, the, big, the big grazer is primarily bison, although we also had um, historically on the grasslands elk. And uh, most people don't realize this, but even though most of the elk are around here in Telluride, historically, most scientists are pretty much convinced that elk was, were a, a grassland animal. So they were much more common in the meadows and much, much more common on the Great Plains. We just happened to extirpate them. 
or wipe them out of the Great Plains. Um, and then antelope, of course. But, but probably the most important was the bison. They create patches by grazing and also by wallowing. Um, and then prairie dogs, of course. We have five species of prairie dogs. We'll talk about that later. Um, they're small. They're a couple pounds each at, at best. Uh, and um, the Gunnison prairie dogs we have here are even a little bit smaller. Um, they don't move anywhere. They live in these little colonies that they defend. Um, and they both play a key role. And there's been a lot of research both on, on bison and on prairie dogs. Um, some research we're actually doing on bison that show the importance of bison on the landscape. And, and bison actually do things like impede the encroachment of juniper and yucca and choya into grassland systems. So they're, they're equally important. Um, prairie dogs as well, uh, we'll, we'll see, have an important role in impeding the intrusion of woody shrubs onto grasslands. So in places, especially if you go to New Mexico, you'll see that what once were big grasslands are now covered with things like mesquite and creosol. And prairie dogs were largely responsible for keeping that off. Um, so grasslands, um, they cover about 40%, 41% of the world's land surface. And um, unfortunately, it's, it's a very good place to grow crops. And as a result, grasslands are the most endangered biome on the planet. They're also the least protected biome on the planet. So there's only, in certain grassland systems like tall grass prairies in North America, 1% to 2% left, many grassland systems. They're really, really critically endangered. And as I mentioned, they're also the least represented in protected areas. So even in, in the United States, we do not have a grasslands national park. Kind of surprising, our biggest biome, our biggest ecosystem is our Great Plains, the, the grasslands of, of uh, North America. And we have no park that's specifically established to protect that grassland system. Pretty, pretty interesting if you think about it. And that's because it is so important for agriculture. And you can see over here the graph she includes of the grassland declines and it's particularly pronounced um, in the Americas. So what's happened over time? Well, one thing that's happened is over time, we've really changed, we've changed the system, not only the agriculture, but where we haven't changed the agriculture, we've replaced native ungulates with domestic ungulates. So cows are ubiquitous. You're gonna find them all over the planet. Um, and in particular, it's mostly cows. Of course, there are other ungulates as well, but, but they are the ones that are, that are dominating the landscape. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, um, they're doing a lot of damage because we're overgrazing them. We're, we're using them too much. A lot of cases, it's because there are perverse incentives. Uh, our governments provide money to let people graze too heavily. In other cases, it's because people are very, very, very poor and they're trying to make a living in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and they really don't have a lot of opportunity. So they push the land a little harder than they otherwise would and otherwise even want to. Um, so in North America, what happened? We, we saw a huge decline in bison um, so that, such that we had approximately, and, and of course these numbers are subject of great debate, but somewhere between 20 and 60 million bison were roaming the Great Plains of North America um, and all the way out east as well. And that we did a really good job in the late 1800s of almost wiping out bison. There were only a couple hundred bison left actually on the planet by the late 1800s. And there were several reasons for that. One was um, to control the so-called Native American problem. And the other was because the value of their, of their hides became, um, went dramatically up as, as the British military in particular started using buffalo hides in their, in their uniforms for their soldiers. Um, so you can see the range decline. Um, and then cattle took over. And the interesting thing um, that I find is that there are actually fewer cattle on that same area of land than there were bison. So it gives you a pause to think. Um, so now we have domestic cattle and they're coexisting in some places with, with prairie dogs. But the reality is the prairie dogs have also declined. And primarily the reason they've declined, there's, there's two primary reasons. The first one and the most important one historically has been poisoning. We, we eradicated prairie dogs. We set out with government sponsored programs starting about 1915 and really picking up steam during the depression, during the Dust Bowl, um, when we need to put people to work. And we poisoned the heck out of prairie dogs. So here's the result of a poisoning campaign. Um, and there's been about a 95% decline in all prairie dog species, some much greater, uh, some a little less. But indeed, all the species have demined, declined dramatically. The other major factor, and one that's continuing to, to um, thwart efforts to conserve, 
things like black-footed ferrets, which rely on prairie dogs, but also prairie dogs themselves is uh, savatic plague. So plague was introduced into this, into this country in 1900. It's slowly making its way from California where it was, in, where it was introduced eastward. Um, they used to think, some biologists, I never believe this, but some biologists thought there was a magic line that once it got wet enough, plague wouldn't move further east than that. But what we found is that plague has passed that magic line and it passed the next magic line. And I don't think anything's really going to stop plague from moving all the way across the country, actually. And so I'm not as convinced that, that if we don't do something about plague, we're not going to lose a lot of things, not just prairie dogs. So those are the two biggest impacts. Of course, there are other impacts, too. Um, we've done a lot of conversion to farmland. We've also um, built a lot of subdivisions. Come to Denver. You can see all around Denver where I live. The subdivisions have gone crazy, and um, that was all prime prairie dog habitat. So perceived competition with cattle is what drove the pressure to poison prairie dogs. Um, so, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more in my talk about that perception. And so um, how are human activities, she poses a question, how are human activities affecting grassland ecosystems and associated biodiversity? This is Hanos. This is in uh, northern Mexico, in Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua. I've been here. It's a beautiful place. I was here around this time, around the time that this photo was taken. Um, huge expanse of grasslands, biggest prairie dog complex in the world at about, uh, in about the turn of the millennium. Um, gorgeous place. And so one of the things she wanted to do was look at how human impacts have affected that Hanos grassland over the past 20 years. So she started about in the early 90s. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the exact date. And um, this is kind of what it looked like. Uh, if you can see the red, those are the prairie dog colonies. Again, it was the biggest complex of colonies at the turn of the millennium. Um, so it was the biggest complex, and now it's still one of the biggest. Um, and it was doing pretty well. But cattle grazing and agriculture have really, really combined in the last 20 years to strongly impact this system. And there's been a lot of pressure for a couple different reasons. One is uh, Frito-Lay moved in, and, and there was strong demand to put more, prop, more land into crop production so they could produce um, uh, things like uh, Doritos and, and things like that. I think it was mostly corn production. And the second thing is the ajitos, that, that, which are group ranches, that graze cattle on this are very poor. And, and there was a lot of increasing pressure as their population grew to put more livestock on the land. And so what happened? Well, they overgrazed the heck out of it. And so from 1990 to, to 2000, in just 10 years, the bare ground cover increased by 142 fold. So 142 times more bare ground um, in, 19, in 2000 than in, and in 1990. And I can attest to seeing this. It was, it's dramatic, um, the changes. And of course, um, people think that prey dogs like this kind of thing. The reality is they do not. And um, it impacts prey dogs dramatically. The populations drop, and they can't persist. Intensive agriculture introduced even greater. So 17,000 times more land in cultivation in the 15 years. Library's closed, just in case you guys want to know. <laughs> 1993 to 2000. So a lot of this is just plowing down land. Um, but it also leads to, to roads, uh, traffic, pesticide use. And so the net result is greater and greater fragmentations of the colonies that remain. Um, and so what you have are Scenes that I see all the time, which are prairie dog, former prairie dog counties have been plowed up and prairie dogs trying to make a living on dirt. Doesn't work very well. Um, the other thing that's happened is we've changed the climate. Um, I don't know if you all believe it. I believe it. I think the data are pretty powerful. Um, and um, even if you don't believe it, the climate has changed. And what we can show, what we show here is that you can see the reduction in, in the amount of rainfall and the other thing that's been happening is the periodicity and drought throughout the world has, has increased. And so we have more, longer, more frequent droughts. And of course, that, that makes it harder to maintain grasslands, maintain wildlife. The area is becoming hotter, drier. Prairie dogs aren't persisting. So the end result for prairie dogs isn't, isn't really a great story. So the blue were the colonies that um, actually good friends of mine mapped in, in 1988. And the orange are the colonies in 2005. And this just shows you in a bar graph form what's been happening, is that as more and more bare ground shows up, the prey duck simply cannot persist. The colonies collapse in upon, upon themselves, and they're just disappearing dramatically. 
73% decline in two decades. So what does that look like on the ground? So that's that picture I showed you earlier in 2002. I was there in 2002. This is the picture today. Um, it's not grass. There's not a lot there that you could graze on if you're a prairie dog or a cow. So um, not, not a good result. Here's, a, here's an illustration of what's happening. So if you look at this, this was a colony um, in, in um, about 19, I think it was 1988. Now it's not a colony. And so what you're seeing is an invasion, as I mentioned, um, of mesquite and also of uh, something called ephedra. So ephedra is what is also known as Mormon tea. So this is really good news if you like Mormon tea. Um, it's not very good news if you like anything else, basically. And uh, it's plenty of ephedra to make lots of Mormon tea if, if you like it. Um, it's, it's way too much, and it's, it's a problem. Um, it's not good forage for livestock. It's not good forage for prairie dogs. It's really not good forage good for anything except making Mormon tea. You've got to really like Mormon tea. Um, and what's the result for the other species, the, the, the animals that live on that landscape? Well, of course, um, as you get rid of the plants that they rely on, they all decline. And this just shows, in bar graph form, the magnitude of the decline of both birds and, and mammals. So up on the up, upper left, you can see um, different species. In total, it's been a dramatic decline in numbers of species. And you can see which animals are hit, hit the hardest. The carnivores, not surprisingly, um, because they require a lot more prey. Um, they're usually the first to go. They decline. Um, and then there's a couple species that actually do better on, on really altered uh, uh, landscapes. And what we find is that what we go is from a very diverse community of mammals or birds to a really simplified community. And, and we showed this all over, um, all over the globe, that when we simplify a system, we're left with a couple species that do really well. Um, so a particular kind of kangaroo rat does really, really well in simplified systems, um, as do hares. Everything else, not so much. And so what we're, what we're ending up with is, a, of course, a global community of, of a few species that do pretty well with us and a lot of species that don't do so well are disappearing. So what are the answers to this question that she posed? How are human activities affecting grass and ecosystems? Well, we're seeing degradation from drought, human land use, and the loss of keystone species, both bison and things like prairie dogs. And that's leading to a cascade of other um, impacts such as the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And um, there's been some real interesting work lately, and, and what they're finding is that people always wondered, you know, is there going to be a tipping point of when we lose species that we're going to be really impacted? And the, real, the most recent research suggests, no, there's not going to be a tipping point. What's happening is we're slowly degrading the ability of, of our planet to provide ecosystem services. So the water's getting a little dirtier, the air's getting a little less clean, um, it's a it's little less able to filter. So, of course, as people, we're able to adapt pretty well to these changes. And that's part of the reason why these changes continue to, to occur. Because as, as new generations come in, their, their standard, their uh, baseline standard is, is at a much lower um, ecologically functioning level than, say, mine is. So my kids would have a much different baseline than I did when I was a kid because that those services are declining at a very slow rate. We're not noticing it. Um, I don't know there's going to be an exact tipping point where the ultimate weed species, but, but I think what, what we're seeing is our quality of life is going to degrade. And so access to stuff like clean water, clean air, um, the ability to go hiking in a beautiful place like Telluride, those, those kind of things that we all, I think, I think we all love, we're going to see less of those. Um, so. Um, Another question, what are the interactive effects of mega, mega herbivores and small burying mammals? Um, can they coexist? Um, here's a picture of cows and, and, and a prairie dog. And um, so she wanted to see, um, you know, what were the separate and interactive effects of prairie dogs and cattle on, on, the, li on the landscape? And what they found is, um, I'm, not, I'm actually, I actually cut a lot of this out because it's a lot of the detail. I, I just don't have the expertise to talk about. But this is something they found in other places too, is that, Cattle tend to associate positively with prairie dog colonies, especially on the edge of prairie dog colonies. And so what we find on all species of prairie dogs is that cows are drawn in, and bison even more so, and elk and, and, um, and pronghorn even more so than, than um, livestock. They prefer gra grazing on, on prairie dog colonies. And why is that? Well, I mentioned, I alluded to it earlier. 
The reason is because the forage quality is so much higher. So they're drawn in, even though there's less forage there, they're drawn in because the quality of that forage is higher. And, and again, I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in my presentation. So um, what are the interactive effects of these things? Um, they, they both have large and rapid impacts. We ta I talked a little about bison wallowing and, and, and knocking back um, mesquite. Um, actually, cattle and prey ducks have a mutualistic relationship. In areas where grass grows fast and tall, Prey dogs benefit from cows because cows, cows knock down the vegetation and it helps them keep, keep the vegetation in their minds under control because they like to see the vegetation clip so they can see predators. So what you'll find, um, not so much in the shortgrass prairie, but everywhere else, the prairie dogs prefer areas, areas that are fairly heavily grazed by cows. And in areas where you pull cows off, so we have these things called um, conservation range program lands. And these are lands where the government pays people not to grow livestock. Where I did my um, research for my PhD in Montana, wherever they had that, the grass was really tall, prairie dogs could not make it in there. They couldn't survive. And they got pushed out. And eventually all those, what we call CRP land, because they weren't grazed, totally excluded prairie dogs. And so prairie dog col colony boundaries on CRP lands were like straight lines, right along the edges. So there was a mutualistic relationship there. The cows like it, prairie dogs like it. Surprising, but true. And there's a syn synergistic effect on biodiversity when we have both present. So um, I think we can have both cows and prairie dogs if we manage them well and we um, don't overgraze the landscape, and that's key. It's hard sometimes, and I know, I know. I've talked to a lot of producers. I lived on a ranch. I have a ranch. It's hard in, in tough years to realize that you're going to damage your long-term productivity by keeping too many animals on that, on that property. Um, I have bison, other people have cows, but they do the same thing. And if you have too many, in a drought year, if you don't reduce, even though you don't have the money, you're going to damage your long-term ability to graze livestock on that property, whether or not you have prairie dogs. It's easier to blame the prairie dogs, of course, um, but the reality is that's what happens. So um, that's kind of a brief overview talk. I, I, I cut out some good stuff. She had a bunch of people to thank, and I'm not going to go through them all. Um, <laughs> She got a lot of funding from a lot of different places. Um, and I'm not going to let you ask questions because I'm going to wait until we're done with my talk. <laughs> so um, let's see. Let's bring up my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about, because I do do research both in the social sciences and in ecological sciences, in particular how prairie dogs influence biodiversity. I'm going to talk about a little bit of both. So prairie dogs, you love them or you hate them. Um, that's what I find is people either really love them or they really hate them. And then there's a lot of people who don't know much about them, but there's very few people that once they learn about them, don't have an opinion. <laughs> so some very basic information. When we talk about prairie dogs, we're actually talking about five species. There are two with black tails and three with white tails. <laughs> black tails, white tails. They live in three countries and 11 states in the U.S. So they're quite broad ranging. Within that range, however, right now, they're really, really fragmented. And I talked a little bit about the sources of the decline and the fact that they've declined so dramatically. So quite basically, the two black-tailed, we have black-tailed prairie dogs. They have the biggest range by far, and a range that, that, that is very much, um, in, very, very important to black-footed to, uh, black ferrets, another species that's dear to my heart. Um, the other species is a Mexican prairie dog, really, really endangered. Just uh, hundreds left down in um, Mexico. Probably once was the same species and got separated a long, long time ago. Um, Black-tailed prairie dog declined dramatically as well, but doing better um, than the Mexican, only because there's more of them. The, the rate of decline has been equally bad, about 98% decline in black-tailed prairie dogs. Pretty amazing. So what are the three white-tailed? Um, Prairie dogs, and I put, the, I put a little dot for Telluride so you know where you are in the map. So you're, you're really close to white-tailed prairie dogs, um, which are more in the northeastern part of Colorado. But you're right um, in the range of Gunnison's prairie dogs. Of course, you know that because you have some right up your valley. And then the third species is the Utah prairie dog. Again, a species that's very much in trouble. It's listed on the Endangered Species Act as threatened. There are fewer than 10,000 Utah prairie dogs left and probably far fewer. Um, Gunnison's prairie dogs... Um, are divided into two, two subspecies, the mountain and the, and the more the flat areas. And the mountain subspecies, the one you have, 
is in trouble. It's, it's, um, it just has been, it's, the Fish and Wildlife Service is reviewing again a petition by Wild Earth Guardians to list that subspecies because it's not doing very well in the mountain systems it inhabits. Those are your five species. Um, all prairie dogs live in what we call towns or colonies, right? Um, and then within those colonies, so the, the colony is the yellow, within those colonies, they live in family groups called, with bl the black-tailed um, prairie dogs, coteries, and with the white-tailed prairie dogs, we call them clans. And these are very much territories. And that's important to realize because they defend them against other prairie dogs. It's usually one to two males, a few females, and they're young. And the males will fight against the males, and the females will fight against the females. And also importantly, the, the males will sometimes sneak off and do sneaky copulations with the neighboring females, and the fe females will sometimes sneak off and do sneaky copulations with the neighboring males, but they will fight. And so um, when we talk about, I'm going to talk about later, perceptions of population, overpopulation, to a prairie dog's mind, there's no such thing. <coughs> and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So changing attitudes over time. I want to talk, talk a little bit about, um, about attitudes. When we go back and we look at the, the writing of the early settlers, mostly the settlers really admired prairie dogs. They said, here are these really industrious animals out there digging holes, clipping vegetation. This is the Protestant work ethic writ large <laughs> right in front of my eyes. They loved them. So that changed. But, but initially, I couldn't find any negative writings about prairie dogs. However, when the open range was converted to fenced properties and farms and, uh, um, and, the, and the cattle drivers couldn't just go somewhere else when the, when the range got degraded, starting around the early 1900s, people started changing their views of prairie dogs. They started viewing them as pests. They said, I can't move my prairie dogs. I, don't, I, I can't move my cattle. I got all these prairie dogs and they're overgrazing the land. And of course, if you got on a prairie dog colony, what is the perception? Of course there's little grass. And so the first studies were actually designed to see what the impact is. It must be huge, right? Um, so the perceived problem is just this. Um, you, you have cows, but look at the edge of this colony. Boy, I mean, they're stealing all the grass, right, these, these prairie dogs. What are some other causes of decline? I, I mentioned this earlier, urban sprawl. So these are some pictures from uh, the greater Denver metro area. Um, not a pretty sight, if you're me. Plague, I mentioned this too. Um, it's a disease we have. Prairie dogs are um, completely, completely susceptible to plague. So people think prairie dogs carry plague. They do not. I'll talk about that later. They die from plague. Um, recreational shooting. It used to be legal in, in Colorado to have um, what they call uh, a contest shoots, which um, isn't really hunting. You can't call it hunting because you go and you sit down and you take big rifles that can shoot far and with exploding bullets and you shoot how many prairie dogs you can kill in a day. And still people sh shoot prairie dogs, um, but they can't do contests in Colorado anymore. So there's a big subculture of, of people who like to shoot prairie dogs. And they have dramatically impacted, despite the rhetoric, they have dramatically impacted, and people have studied this, prairie dog colonies in, in se several areas. Um, but it's a lesser of an impact. So go back to changing attitudes over time. So, so people started disliking prairie dogs. But then what happened um, in the late 1900s? We started discovering something out about, else about prairie dogs. We started say, finding that, boy, they're actually really, really important to the landscape. We call them keystone species. It's like the keystone in an arch. You pull it out, the whole arch falls, right? That's what a prairie dog is. Um, they're ecosystem engineers. And we started discovering the importance of prairie dogs to that system out there. There's a lot of other species that depend on prairie dogs or at least benefit from prairie dogs. And it's a big number. It's in the hundreds. It's a lot of species. Um, and it kind of all got took off with Blackfoot of Ferret conservation. Um, Blackfoot of Ferrets, if you don't know, were the only native ferret to North America and declined to as few as 10 animals. 10 animals in the wild in the, in the 1980s. Um, dying from a, a, a combined whammy of plague, which they are also susceptible to, and canine distemper. We caught them all up, we put them in captivity to try to breed them. And as we started researching them, we knew, boy, we need prairie dogs because that's all they eat. And so we also said, boy, a lot of other things eat prairie dogs. This is just a slide of something. That's a really important, rich prey source. And I can tell you that um, I got a, a good friend, John Hoagland, who studies prairie dogs up in North Park. 
and I, and I went to visit him, and it was one of the best places if you ever, ever want to go to see predators. <laughs> in like three days, I saw weasels preying on prairie dogs and badgers, and um, I saw a golden eagle take one, and a Swainson hawk take a young one, and owls take them, and snakes take them, and everything takes prairie dogs that, that can, um, especially the young, and especially gunnisons that are a little bit smaller. So it's an incredibly important um, prey patch. High density of animals, and the other important thing to realize is that there are more other small mammals living on prairie dog colonies than in the surrounding landscape. So the density of other small mammals, mice and such, is higher. So it's a really rich prey source, not just the prairie dogs, but all those other small mammals. And so things really are attracted. If you want to go see coyotes hunt or bobcats at night or badgers, I recommend checking out a prairie dog colony and, and sitting and watching. You'll see hawks come over. Um, you, you'll see badgers come out. You'll see a lot of times badgers and coyotes will hunt together. It's very interesting to watch them do that. One will, one will start, the badger will start digging and the coyote will sniff the holes and find the, the, the escape hatch by smell and sit and wait at the escape hatch. So the prey dog has two choices. I can wait till the badger digs me out or I can run out into the jaws of the coyote. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> what else? I, already, I mentioned this too. They're attracted to the burrows. So burrowing owls, messing the burrows. Rattlesnakes. We, did it, we, we have a study of, um, of rattlesnakes in eastern uh, Colorado. In almost, no, I think every single rattlesnake we tagged hibernates in a prairie dog burrow. Um, so we might not, a lot of people don't like rattlesnakes, but they're incredibly important on the landscape. Other animals usurp the burrows, like weasels. Um, we find that things that you wouldn't associate the Great Plains with, like amphibians, tiger salamanders, they're out there. How do they survive that really arid environment? Well, they survive it by going down into the burrows during the day. And they are particularly more common on prairie dog colonies, of course. So all kinds of critters, cottontails, use those burrows. What else? Well, some, some species preferentially nest in open habitats. So things like, um, in particular, um, <coughs> mountain plovers, which um, I have a baby one over there, and horned larks, they really like open habitats. Um, and so they nest preferentially on, um, prairie dog, on prairie dog colonies. Other animals, oh, here's a mount plover. Other, and, and that's another species that's petitioned for listing, declining dramatically. Um, other species prefer to prey, uh, to forage on prairie dog colonies. If you think about it, if you're eating insects, what better place to forage than a prairie dog colony where the grass is a little bit lower? It's a lot easier to see those insects, right? So they're attracted. And then surprisingly, as I mentioned, we've started doing research and we found other animals that graze are attracted to prairie dog colonies. In particular, bison, elk, um, to a lesser extent, um, mule deer, and pronghorn spend more time than we would expect on a prairie dog colony given the proportion of prairie dog colonies on the landscape. They really get drawn into that um, vegetation. And so when, we, when, when scientists first went out there to figure this out, um, they, they were confused. And I'm going to talk about what, what we found. So, <clears throat> so, the, so the second big phase was Prairie dogs are important because they're keystone species. And then the last big phase is this rise of, of people that helped that invited me here today. And these are the prairie dog lovers, the prairie dog supporters. And starting in the 1990s, and I gotta say something happened in the 1990s, because in the 1980s, I was trying to tell people about the plight of prairie dogs, they're dying from plague, people are poisoning them. And I couldn't get anybody to listen, it seemed like. It seemed like that nobody cared that much about prairie dogs. But in the 1990s, something changed. I don't know what it was. But now, there are all kinds of groups that are established to help protect prairie dogs. People love to watch them. I can tell you I work in a zoo. The most popular exhibit at any zoo that has them is the prairie dog colony. Why? They're active. They're out there in the day. They're a mammal that's active during the day. They kiss. They run around. They do stuff. They're fascinating. People love them. They spend, people spend more time. A big joke when I lived in Montana was, from the state agency, was, you know, what was the most popular state <coughs> park in Montana. It was a prairie dog colony right off of Interstate I-90. And it was a big laughing matter to them. I said, I don't know why you guys joke about this. You could charge admission and you'd be making a mint. <laughs> it's your most popular park in your park system. That should be telling you something, not making you laugh. I mean, these are interesting animals. People want to see them. All the people going to Yellowstone are stopping by and saying, wow, this is cool, and spending time there. Um, that should tell you something. People like prairie dogs. They like to watch them. They're interesting. So this was another big phase, you know, the biggest world's biggest prairie dog, South Dakota. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Prairie dog watching has become incredibly popular, and um, I think it will continue to be so. And, and part of the reason it's become popular is because some of the f some of the only places you can see prairie dogs easily is near urban areas because um, there's this kind of donut effect I call it, where prairie dogs get forced out as as we develop, but on the edges as we buy ranches and people stop poisoning, they do pretty well until we start paving it over. And so there's these prairie dogs on the fringe of all of our urban areas increasingly. And, and, and once you leave that fringe, like drive out in eastern Colorado, try to find some prairie dogs that aren't on the edge of Denver or Boulder or Fort Collins. Pretty hard to find, actually. Drive around the mountains up here. Try to find more Gunnison prairie dog colonies. Not so easy to find. So they're being protected by us. People like them. <clears throat> and we have, like I said, a whole bunch of groups. The Prairie Dog Coalition was formed to try to bring all those groups together and, um, and try to work in, in concert with each other to do stuff for prairie dogs. And there's people making money on prairie dogs. There's a ton of prairie dog products out there. <laughs> so, <coughs> what we're seeing now is persistent myths and really a lot of growing conflict. This is the situation we have today. And really, these diverse views are, are really based on different attitudes. So we have people who want to shoot them, we have the prairie dogs who don't like to get shot, so they want to shoot back, but they don't know how to use the weapons. <laughs> We're poisoning them. Um, people are trying to protect them um, in protesting. This conflict is really, is really escalated, and, and I think you're seeing that right here in Telluride. And so um, this growing conflict among stakeholders <laughs> makes it very hard for the managers, who are often in the middle, um, and are hearing different sides of the story. So I was going to talk a little bit about... Um, Oh, I'll talk a little bit about the situation. It has become so dramatic that um, we have stuff like this. You know, John Thune in South Dakota. This was something he sent out, you know, during the campaign. Um, West River menace. They must be hunted down and killed. They're hurting the Western ranch economy. Um, so, and then here's another one's ads. They're lining up to vote for Tom Daschle. If you remember, Tom Daschle was the speaker. He lost to John Thune. One of the reasons he lost was because of prairie dogs. So there was a paper in the Washington Post, but an even bigger paper in, in England where they were totally amused and perplexed that this little rodent was changing the shape of American politics. And indeed it did. He lost. He lost the election. He was one of the most powerful um, politicians in America, and he lost over prairie dogs. And what's the most interesting to me is it's not because he loved prairie dogs. It's because he didn't hate them as much as John Thune hated them. <laughs> That's why he lost. So here's a really contentious contextual problem that we're faced with if we want to conserve prairie dogs. Um, and not everyone does, of course. But again, who hates prairie dogs the most? That's what it's all about. That, that was the subheading of the article. Unbelievable. So what are the continuing reasons for disliking prairie dogs? They eat grass. I just I mentioned this. I would say more importantly <clears throat> is that to a rancher, they're a symbol of poor stewardship. Their neighbors look out there and say, how can you let that happen? Look at all that bare ground. It looks like a moonscape. It looks horrible. Um, and they want to be seen as somebody who's growing grass. They like that, that verdant pasture, all that green grass growing. And to them, it hurts them. They, they want to be seen as a good steward of the land, not somebody who lets their land get degraded. And so to them, a big part of it, even probably bigger than the grass, is the symbolic importance of what prairie dogs are doing to the landscape in their minds. They're also a symbol of loss of control. So, you know, in some rural areas, this is, uh, where I'll, this is right next, this is my next door neighbor, and I don't know if you can say it says, no trespassing, we shoot. So, you know, my neighbors are, you know, it's eastern Colorado. It's, uh, they're losing, especially in the eastern part of the state, populations disappearing. They're trying hard to keep the family farm, but the corporate farms are buying them out. They're striking out at everything they can, um, and they see environmentalists and the government and prairie dogs is stopping them from being able to stay on the land with their families. And it's a sad story, I think. I mean, I, I would love to have the family farms. They're actually better stewards of the land generally than these big corporate ranches. But they're, they're having a hard time. And so prairie dogs are just another symbol of that loss of control, as are wolves and coyotes. Loss of control. They used to have total control of the agencies that ran public lands, the ranchers did. 
They're losing that control. They're losing the ability to live a lifestyle they really like. It's a great lifestyle. You guys all live here for a reason. It's beautiful. You want to live in rural Colorado. So do they. They don't know, have the, the, the skills and expertise you have, probably, to make the living the way you do. So think about that. It's not just the grass. And these are, these are findings we, that we, we found, and it does conflict with other land uses. So here's a golf course in, in, in Utah. It's a subject of great consternation. Here's a threatened species. I found prairie dogs run over by golf carts on the, on the golf course because they can't poison them. They don't want the prairie dogs on their golf course. What do you do? It's a big problem. I think you got the same issues here, right? Um, you don't want them in your, in your ballparks. You don't want them on your golf course. You don't want them in your garden. So these conflicts with land uses create problems. And then fear of diseases. You know, prairie dogs die of plague. I don't want to get plague. For God's sakes, that's what, that's bubonic plague. That's what people, people are, we lost, what, a third of the population of the world when plague hit. Okay, so let's look at more relatively recent findings and see, let's look at these, all these issues in more detail. Well, the more recent research has found, as I mentioned, that prairie dogs actually improve quality. So when, when, when researchers first went out, they found they penned cows on colonies and they penned off cows off colonies, and they found no statistical difference in weight gain. And they're like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense. They were fully expecting, all the research was, researchers were fully expecting to find a dramatic impact of prairie dogs on cows. So they started doing research, and they found, boy, it's like when you cut your grass, right? What happens? It grows back. Cut it again, it grows back. If you stop cutting grass, what happens? The grass stops growing. What, when, what happens when the grass stops growing is that grass becomes more lignified, harder to digest. So what you want as a grazer is something that's really easy to digest. You want that fresh growth, stuff that's just growing. There's not a lot of cell wall. There's a lot of nitrogen in that fresh growth. That's the stuff you really want. High in protein, that's the good stuff. Once it stops growing, you don't want it. That's why you hear Ranchers talk about the need to burn or rank grass. What rank grass is, it's grass that's matured all the way out. The cows don't touch it. That's why you have things called grazing lawns in Africa. Little patches and savannas that are open and maintained by the grazers who go there because they want that fresh growth. That's what prairie dogs give you. So they give you higher quality. They give you continual growth. But they give you less biomass. And cows need a certain amount of biomass. So it's, it's definitely best if you're a cattle rancher to have a mix of on and off colony areas. They also have different plants. They have more forbs, which are flowering plants. Much easier to digest than grasses. So things like antelope love it. So these, are, these differences are really, really important to understand, but not something that is intuitive. You know, you look out, they say, of course you can't put as many cows on there. So you start doing the math and you say, actually you can keep almost as many cows in. You do lose some capacity to, to, to put some cows on there, but it's like 6%. And let me tell you, if you're managing your property for cows on a 6% margin, you're, margin, you're, you're managing it too close because you're going to get a drought or something like that's going to happen, and you're going to go out of business. So the reality is you should at least keep 10 to 15% of your forage out there um, as a buffer anyway. And if you do that, prairie dogs have very little impact on your ability to, as long as, again, you have a mix. Um, another thing, prairie dogs, boom, they, they explode. Their population's all over the place. No, prairie dogs are actually one of the slowest reproducing rodents in the world. They produce one litter a year, just one, no matter what anyone tells you, just one. Um, John Hooglin, the guy I talked about in North Park, studied all species for 30 years. He's marked thousands of prairie dogs. I've done some. Khan, who you're going to hear about later, has done some. An has done some. We've never found a prairie dog, and you can tell one when, when a prairie dog has a litter because they get scars in their, in their inside, that ever has had two litters in one year. Never happened. Not in the history of prairie dogs. One litter. Litter size is actually relatively small. It's two to six. Most of those don't survive to adulthood. Usually only one or two. And prairie dogs only live, on average, three years. Most prairie dogs, most females, don't reproduce until their second year. So the first year, not reproducing. So if you live to three years, you got two years to produce. That is a very slow reproducing animal, especially for a rodent. Um, so that brings up that thing I talked about earlier. Overpopulation is a human construct. We, we say, oh, that colony's overpopulated. I hear it all the time in Denver. Well, not if you're a territorial animal, because guess what? If you're a territorial animal and you don't have enough food, what are you going to do? You're going to expand your territory. And prairie dogs do go and kill each other, and they especially kill the young of other prairie dogs. 
So if they're stressed, two things are going to happen. That prairie dog is going to feel a need for food. So the females are going to go kill the, the, the young of other females in neighboring coteries if they can. High protein, they're going to eat that. That's food. That's energy. It's going to wipe them out over time. The next thing is they're going to actually literally fight as the adults, and they're going to kill each other, and they're going to expand their territory until they have enough territory. That's what prairie dogs do. They're territorial. They're not going to allow themselves to starve to death if they can. So they naturally regulate their population for a given plot of land. What you see, why do prairie dog colonies expand during drought? There are actually fewer prairie dogs. I can tell you, I've done the, I've done the work. It's because they need more food, so their so they're, they're territories expand. That's why their colonies expand, even though there's fewer prairie dogs. So don't let your eyes deceive you. You know, we used to think that the earth was flat and that the, that the uh, sun went around the earth, because that's what it looks like. Not true when you do the science. They don't carry plague. I hear this all the time, too. They die too fast. Prairie dogs die. They get plagued, they die. And anyone, look at CDC, look at their website. They will tell you on the website that prairie dogs are no concern for carrying plague. They just die too fast. What you don't want to do is pick up a dead prairie dog on a colony. You don't want to let your dog run around a colony and pick up, pick up dead prairie dogs because they might have plague, and the fleas that are on that prairie dog might jump onto your dog or onto you. So when people die of plague, it's because with the associated with prairie dogs, it's usually, and there's only been a couple, it's usually either a researcher, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say, um, or it's a, um, a lot of cases it's been Native Americans who eat, who consume them, and they don't realize what they're consuming is a, is a they find this dead prairie dog and they want to eat it, and you know traditionally it was part of their, their um, culture to eat prairie dogs, and they eat them and, and they die of, uh, they die of plague. What gets, what does spread plague are the other species out there, deer mice, coyotes. I don't want to give, but coyotes are a worse name than they already have. Coyotes, but they spread it. Deer mice, and there are other reservoirs. We think maybe northern grasshopper mice. That's what keeps plague out in the landscape. Prairie dogs just die too fast. Boom, they die. The other thing about prairie dogs is by far most of the prairie dogs that die of plague die in their burrow. And I always tell people, think about it. When you get sick, what do you do? You go home and call him bed, right? That's what a prairie dog does too. So where's his bed? It's not up above the ground. It's down underground. Um, so most of the prairie dogs that die of plague are dying underground. And what we usually find is not a bunch of dead prairie dogs. I had plague hit the prairie dogs on my ranch. I didn't see any dead prairie dogs. I saw very few prairie dogs. I said, that's weird. Then you find the fleas, and you test the fleas. Oh, it's plague. So they don't carry plague. They die of plague in huge numbers. It's a big, big problem. Bear too, too. They're working on a plague vaccine that can be orally delivered um, through baits and stuff. Because otherwise, I don't hold a lot of hope for prairie dogs, actually. If we can't solve the, pl the plague problem, we're in big trouble for ferrets and prairie dogs and mountain plovers and burrowing owls and a lot of other things. Now that here's, here's, here's a big take home message I want you all to, to remember, and this is something I do as a social scientist. I look at uh, knowledge and attitudes, and the reality is knowledge is not correlated with attitudes. So simply having an education program, it's not going to work. Sorry. The highest knowledge we found were among environmentalists and ranchers insignificantly different. They had the same knowledge about prairie dogs, but they also had the most divergent views. One group loved them, one group hated them. They both knew equally the same amount. So if you think you're going to go tell the rancher something about prairie dogs and all of a sudden he's going to love them, probably not. Remember that list of stuff I gave you earlier. It's not just about the grass. Even if they don't believe, even if they don't believe the science, really it's about control. It's about changes in lifestyle. The prairie dog is a symbol, much like the wolf is a symbol. The wolf isn't just the wolf, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of changes that you don't like. You're trying to make a living on the Great Plains of North America. Where the Great Plains of North America now qualifies as frontier under the definition that the United States used for the first time since the 1800s because there's less than one person per square mile in a lot of the places, like where I have my ranch, and other places throughout the Great Plains, outside of the cities. It's depopulating. Towns are dying. People can't keep their kids. It's hard to make a living. Family farms are disappearing. People don't like it. They're, they're upset. They like their lifestyle. So what do we do? How do we, how do we get people to like prairie dogs more? Um, uh oh, I'm talking too long. One, we should work to dispel myths. 
So we do need, knowledge isn't always bad, and it's good to dispel the myths and explain to people why. So, you know, if you're a little kid and you say, oh, the, the sun goes around the earth, and you explain to a little kid, no, no, the earth actually goes around the sun. Explain to them. Explain how it really works. And um, if they need to, show them some papers. Be sympathetic but not condescending. I think the worst thing to do is be condescending to, to, um, to people who don't like prairie dogs. My personal feeling with, with everything I do is I respect everyone's opinion because they have a right to have it just as much as I have a right to have my opinion. And you know what? Like I said, it's usually the, the issue is usually about so much more. And where I lived, uh, I lived on a ranch in, in Montana for a lot of years when I was doing my work up there. And my, some of my best friends were the ranchers. <clears throat> and I had ranchers come to me and they'd say, They'd say, you know what, Rich, I like you. <clears throat> I don't agree with you about prairie dogs. I think until the day I die, I'm going to try to convince you about prairie dogs. You're going to try to convince me about prairie dogs. But you're not trying to pull my legs. You know, you're going to tell me the truth. You're going to tell me what you think. And we're going to have a good civil discussion about it. We're going to be friends. We're going to drink beer. And it's going to be cool. And you're welcome to my house. If I'm not there, stop by, have a beer anytime if you're in the neighborhood. You know, realize where I lived, it was usually about 15 miles between the next house. So, you know, a beer is sometimes a good thing to have. Um, and he would say to me, I remember one guy saying to me, one of the best comments I ever got was this. You know, those other guys, those other biologists, they're just telling me what I want to hear. And he was especially talking to some of the state agency folks up in Montana who were trying to, trying to get in on their good side. And the ranchers picked that up. They're not, they're not idiots. They know. So just be honest with them. This is what I feel, and I, I empathize with your plight. I do. I do empathize with their plight. How do they make a living on that land? I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, I wish they'd switch over to bison and have less labor costs. I like bison better. But anyway, that's always my argument. And I'm going to tell them that. And so, so what I found is that I was really received by the local community of ranchers pretty well because I didn't hide. I didn't, I didn't have a hidden agenda. My agenda was my agenda. I said, they said, you know what, you're going to put ferrets out here whether I like it or not. I said, you know, because after I finished my PhD, I went to work for the, the government doing ferret stuff. And I said, yeah, that's probably true. I said, I, I'm not going to lie to you. It's probably true. So you can either work with me and try to influence the way we do that or fight it and get it imposed upon you by others. And they get that. And I think that's what they want to hear. And I think they want to hear the truth and they want to work with you. But they want, to, they want some common sense solutions. You know, can we put up barriers, um, visual barriers, to, to stop prairie dogs from going somewhere? Yes. Do they work 100%? No. But we can also move prairie dogs. And there are some, some techniques we've developed over the years that work really, really well. Don't just move the prairie dog, but fill the burrow. Make it unpleasant to go back there. Prairie dogs don't go back. So there's things we can do. Um, here's a key one. It's not just education. It's having positive experiences. So the, some of the most important things that influence people's values are your friends and your neighbors and the people you like and also the people you don't like. So if I am a Democrat, and I am, I'll admit it, and a Republican says something, what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to discount it. So what we want to do, and we're trying to do this at Denver, we're trying to set up a rancher speaker bureau. I want to get the ranchers who like wildlife, the ranchers who like prairie dogs, and they are out there. I guarantee you. I had a rancher who told me not to tell anybody, but he has an easement on his property for prairie dogs in Montana. And he said, if you ever tell anyone, I'll deny it. Because I can't go to a meeting and say it. But those, some of them will say it. And get those ranchers to talk to the ranchers. Because the people you like are the people you listen to. The people who are most similar to you are the ones you listen to. You're not going to listen to um, an environmentalist, some hippie tree-hugging freak. You're going to listen to another rancher. The other thing is positive experiences. Do something fun with prayer. Don't always make it a negative thing. The second thing that influences your attitudes the most is having a positive experience with something. So to the extent that we make it fun to do something with prairie dogs, take the kids out, show them prairie dogs, go prairie dog watching. If you can get them out there, um, great. You know, we got to break down barriers. we got to do things that are fun. Those positive experiences are what stay with you and influence your attitudes and values the most, even more than information, even more than preconceived notions. If you go out there and you have a good time, you're going to change your opinion. It's amazing how much a positive experience affects your, your attitude more than just about anything else except those liked and disliked reference groups. So let's try to figure out ways to have fun with prairie dogs. And we can. Um, <clears throat> this is what I just talked about. Work with like stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> people have, who, have, who are in your culture, the ones you're going to listen to. And then un address those underlying concerns. 
Don't be condescending, but address them. And you don't have to say, I know that you're really concerned. You're not really concerned about paradise. You're really concerned about loss of power. Don't say it like that. That's really paternalistic and patronizing. <laughs> but address them. Say, how can we keep you on the land? You know, if, if I want to work with you. I'm working with, I'm working with um, ranchers in Nebraska, right? <clears throat> and what we're doing is trying to keep the family ranch on, on the ground in Nebraska. And, I, and I'm working with this ranch family. And what we did is we helped them set up some ecotourism. They got some leks on their properties. They set up some school buses as blinds. People go look at the, the, the chickens. And um, they set up a, you know, some bunkhouses, some really nice but kind of rustic-looking bunkhouses for people to stay. They make money. And he's been able to, this, this ranch has been able to keep his son on the property. He was really worried. He couldn't subdivide the property. And he, and he, ca he came to me during this whole process. It was a couple years into the program. And he goes, Rich? He's a great guy. He's got a handlebar must, you know, mustache and the hat and the whole, the whole thing. He goes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but can you help me get some prairie dogs? <laughs> I said, what? He said, yep. My clients, they come to see the birds, and they want to go see some prairie dogs every time, and I'm paying my neighbors. I don't want to pay them anymore. <laughs> I want to get them on my property. I said, I'm happy to help you. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to do. That's how I want to work to build support for biodiversity conservation. That's how I want to build support for prairie dogs. He's all of a sudden saying, holy cow, why do the, why do the, why do the bird watchers want to go to a prairie dog colony? I told you. They're going to see all those other animals. They're going to see burning owls, mountain plovers. They might see a frugious hawk. They're going to see coyotes, badgers. They want to see stuff. And they know, those wildlife people know, the rancher in Kansas, I don't know if you've been following the fair stuff at all, but there's a rancher in Kansas. Um, he, he likes prairie dogs. He's got 20,000 acres. He's got a buffer zone around his property where there are no prairie dogs to, to help protect his neighbors. They've reintroduced Blackfoot of Ferrets onto his property. Kansas is trying to make him, through their good neighbor laws, poison the prairie dogs on his property because they don't want the prairie dogs. He's like, look, I've created a buffer, everything. Like, well, this law exists. And you talk to him, and I talked to him because he called me up. He said, I saw you on CNN or some, some odd place. And I, you know, and what you talk about with associated species is exactly why I like prairie dogs. And I said, you know, he really is. And I said, you're the kind of rancher I like because you're the guy who lives, who lives the rhetoric that I'm hearing from all my rancher friends, which is nobody loves wildlife more than ranchers. Well, if, you, if that's true, then you've got to like these guys because they bring in the other wildlife. So there are those guys out there, like I said, um, and we just got to help them. And we've got to show other ranchers, like I'm doing in Nebraska, then he goes on a little speaking tour, says, I'm making more money with prairie dogs and tourism than I am with just my cows. And next thing, it's, how do I get bison? Place my cows with, you know, he's like, I'm probably never going to get rid of cows, but I might want some bison. I'm like, I think you probably do, because it's going to bring in a whole other crowd of tourists for you. That's what I want. So that's how you address the underlying concerns without being patronizing. You help him figure out that how do you keep on staying the land? How do you still make a living? How do you keep a vibrant um, community on the landscape that you want to be part of? And be patient. It's going to take time. You know, um, attitudes aren't changed easily. Sometimes they're intergenerational. And so we just got to know that. We got to realize that. We got to, um, we got to be very patient and understanding with the people around us. And I think it'll happen. I think it is already happening. And so uh, <laughs> with that, I'm going to end. I think I went about five minutes over, um, but I will take uh, some questions on either talk if I can answer. I don't know if I can answer your questions, but if I can, I'll try. Hopefully you're not bored. Nobody left. That's good. And nobody's even asleep. Yes. Fleas from the prairie dogs can get onto dogs. They sure can. Can they get from dogs onto humans at all? They can. Another important thing to remember about fleas, though, is that fleas tend to be quite, for the most part, quite species specific. So the only so if your dog runs through a prairie dog colony that doesn't have plague, you don't have to worry so much because the prairie dogs want to go on a prairie. I mean, the, the prairie dog fleas want to go on a prairie dog, for the most part. Why do they go on a dog? Well, because the prairie dog's dead. And you get hungry enough and you're a flea, you're going to jump on anything you can, right? So any flea that's hungry enough will, will switch hosts. And that's the big danger as a human, too. It's skinning, skinning a prairie dog and eating, of course. You can get it that way. But 
The other people get it it's because they pick up a dead prey dog and the flea jumps on them and bites them because it's so hungry. Yeah. You mentioned that you actually had displays on your um, ranch. How did you eradicate it? You can't, as far as I know, eradicate plague. But what we do is we try to control it, and we, and it's not it's not a great option. I have to say, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of it, but I do it anyway. Is we the only thing we know to do is to dust the prairie dog colony for with a with a um, with an insecticide that kills the and I, I don't like doing it because I'm worried about secondary effects. Um, but the powder um, I will say that we use um, becomes inactive when it gets wet, and um, there are no secondary impacts in terms of an animal that eats a flea or a, an insect that dies of it, but I'm still killing other insects undoubtedly, which I don't want to do. So it's not a great solution right now, but it's the only thing I know, and, and um, a lot of those insects actually benefit from prey dogs, so to the extent I can keep the prey dogs, they tend to do better, but it's the only thing I know of. So, looks like someone over there. Yes. How do you maintain biodiversity on, on, in, in, on, on a plot of land? Yeah, if, for example, if there's prairie, prairie dogs there, but not the other species, how can you get other species yeah. in there? There's, there's ways to do that, but um, generally speaking, depending where the prairie dog colony is, believe me, they will find it. <laughs> um, the, the predators will search for places like those rich prey, prey patches, and what you'll see with, with carnivores is that when they search, it's, it's very interesting research has been done on predators. When they find a rich, rich pay, prey patch, they'll leave it, but they'll remember it, and they'll come back much more frequently to places that have what we call rich prey patches than other patches. The other thing you can do to facilitate, especially if you're like in an urban area like this or, or you know, close to exurban, really close to suburbia, for like things like raptors, you can put up perches and things because they like perches. And if you're a raptor, you like to perch. Um, so one thing I do tell people, if you have a prey dog colony that's, that's maybe doing too well because it's in an urban area and you don't have a lot of the native predators is perches might help. They might encourage raptors to come in and, and use the area more, which we find does, does work. Um, and then some species simply are not going to be, they just don't do well near people and they're, they won't come into colonies that are very close, but otherwise they'll find it. Uh, yeah. Going back, oh sorry, okay. to the flea issue, when your dogs get fleas, like mine have gotten fleas three years ago that I had a treat and I had to like, do laundry three times a week and vacuum almost every day to get rid of them. And that was a mountain village. Yeah. But <coughs> where were those fleas from? Oh, there's fleas all over the landscape. I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna ever get rid of fleas. Um, the, other, the other thing to know about plague, and this is a very important point as well, is that plague is actually quite easily treated. And most people that die from plague, it's because they've missed, they, they were misdiagnosed. So, actually, even penicillin will kill the plague back, the plague vi bacteria. Some, I mean, penicillin doesn't work on much, but it actually works on plague. So it's very easy to knock it out as long as it hasn't progressed to the point where you have swollen glands, which is where the bubonic part comes from, the bulbous stuff. But if you start getting symptoms and you know there's a chance that you were, you know, in an area with plague, if you get an antibiotics right away, you'll be fine. And, and I've had biologist friends who have gotten, I, I have one biologist friend, um, we gave him an award, not because of this, but because he deserved it, but his daughter, his daughter got plague work with him, his wife was not too happy, but they gave her antibiotics and nothing. I mean, it was no problem. <laughs> Same thing with your dog. Your dog, antibiotics, knock it right out. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, that works too. Yeah. You know, just to relieve everybody's fears about it, the, the United States averages about 15 cases a year and of those, only one in eight is fatal. So you're talking two people a year out of 300 million. And the people dying, um, most of them aren't even associated with prey dogs. So I know one, one guy, the last death that I, um, of which I'm aware was from a mountain lion, actually. So. The reproductive rate that you mentioned seems to be uh, less uh, rapid than what we're seeing in the valley floor. The valley floor population is expanding fairly quickly. And I was wondering if you had any insight into that. Also, the question 
that uh, that I get the most is where did those prairie dogs come from? Because um, we've all lived here for at least I have for a long time, and they weren't out there. And um, then once the cattle were taken off, they appeared. Yeah, my guess would be that if the prairie dogs are expanding faster than um, you think might be natural, there's one of two or both things happening. One is likely, which is that there are fewer predators here than you have in other areas further away from towns. That's very likely to be the case. Um, my guess is you have fewer raptors um, right in town here than pretty close outside of town. Same thing with probably coyotes and things like that. So that's that's one factor. Um, and the second... You can probably guess. Yeah, of. and the other thing is, prairie dogs can actually go pretty far when they're young. Um, so in June, what you might notice is that the prairie dog colonies expand more more rapidly right around June, and that's when the um, the young of the previous year get expelled and um, go to look for other places to live, and so they can go further than you think especially with the white-tailed group, the, the uh, white-tails, the Gunnisons, and the Utahs, they can go quite far, um, miles and miles, before they find a new home. And so what could be happening, and again, I don't know, and it's an area that we need more research on, but what could be happening is that there might be um, prairie dogs that aren't doing so well somewhere else, and they're looking for a better place, and they found it, and that better place is in your valley floor. Um, that could well be, um, and also, it's not always just the urban areas, but if the valley floor is heavily used by agricultural interests, a lot of times agricultural interests do things like shoot coyotes and um, shoot hawks even. And so you'd be surprised that some of the areas that you think weren't being impacted, the predators weren't being impacted, they are. And we found that um, colonies that away from uh, roads do much worse than colonies near roads and it's because people drive down roads pull out their gun and you might not know about it but they they shoot stuff and usually it's a coyote girl. Boy, I remember these one group of guys that were killing skunks for whatever reason I don't know. Yeah. In predation would something like reintroduction of black footed ferret into the valley floor be a possibility or is that too close to this uh, population center? It's not too close to the population center, but my guess is you don't have nearly enough prairie dogs. So what they want, um, and I don't even think it's enough, is they want is 2,000 acres of prairie dog colony. And so my guess is you don't have 2,000 acres of prairie dog colony. Um, and that's black-tailed prairie dog colony. So with a Gunnison, you probably need three to 4,000 acres. Um, because think about it, to have a big enough population of ferrets to persist, they need a fair number of prairie dogs that can reproduce, but you might not have enough of our things like badgers and, and, and coyotes if you're, if you're looking at natural control. But again, some of the things you can do, our perch sites are really helpful for, for raptors, especially the bigger raptors, which is what you want. You want the bigger raptors, except in spring, you'll be surprised, all your, your red tails, and I don't think you get Swainsons here, but they'll take the, the young prairie dogs. Um, so will things like rattlesnakes, they'll, they'll eat the young prairie dogs. They'll go in and they'll take out a whole litter. So. We had badgers. Okay. Yes. Is there a population uh -huh. level at which you find that the um, prairie dogs negatively affect <coughs> the ecosystem? Well, again, it's um, <clears throat> these are often human constraints. So, so um, for me, if I want natural regulation, I let I let nature regulate itself, right? Um, but if you're trying to manage for something, and I don't know what that something might be, but if you're trying to manage for something. Yeah, there could be a point that, that, that you're not happy. Um, certainly, again, if, if, if you have a ballpark or something and you want to keep them out, then you might have a, an issue with how many prairie dogs there are. If, um, another way to, to, to manage prairie dog populations, and this won't make a lot of ranchers happy, is to graze less heavily because prairie dogs do less well in less heavily grazed terrain because the predators have a better chance of getting in. So again, that's a touchy topic, I realize. Um, the other good thing is to Again, bring in bison, because what bison will do is they'll hit the colony hard, 
but they won't hit other areas very hard, and so the prairie ducks have a hard time expanding out because the vegetation outside is. Um, and that's what we find is that where you've replaced cows with bison, the prairie ducks actually have a harder time expanding. It's kind of interesting, but it's, um, it's true, and I think it's because we don't have enough bison. I think historically, bison, like cows, would heavily hit an area and then go away. Prairie dogs would, would colonize that area, do pretty well until the grass grew back up. And then by that time, hopefully the bison would come back from the prairie dogs' perspective, but maybe not. Maybe that would be extirpated. It was a, I think it was a shifting mosaic, is what we think, of grazed and ungrazed areas. So, again, it, it depends what you manage for, but my perspective is if we let nature regulate itself, there's no such thing as damage. Prairie duck colonies that have been there for a really long time will have a lower diversity of small mammals than prairie dogs that are newer. That I will tell you. Those things are definitely true. Yeah. So if, um, if bison or buffalo hadn't been eradicated from this area, they would still be here, correct? They'd probably come and go. A valley like this, my guess is they wouldn't be here every year. In, in a valley like this in the mountains, um, bison would come, probably use it pretty heavily, then leave, and maybe not come back for three years. Maybe come back right away. It, it would just depend. Would there be any logic in your mind of um, reintroducing bison to the valley? I always area? am a big fan of putting bison back on the land. I, I, I really like them. Um, they do, again, what, we have another project where we're looking at the impacts of bison on the landscape, and it's also research we're doing with prairie dogs. And what we find is that, so one thing you may not realize, most people don't realize, is grassland birds have declined by far more than any other group of birds in North America. And our theory is that it's because of what I talked about earlier. We've replaced bison with cows, and we manage for this kind of monoculture out there. Instead of having a system that we used to have where bison had wallows and areas that hit hard and areas that didn't hit at all, and a really diverse grassland system with basically the same number of animals, actually. Um, so one of the things I always tell ranchers, too, is that what I don't understand, if, if you tell me that you don't believe me about prairie dogs and bison, um, I mean cows competing, how could we have had an estimated 5 billion prairie dogs and 30 million bison, and now we have 25 million, or 20 million, I mean, cows and 5 million prairie dogs? If they're competing so badly, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. If there were more bison, and more prairie dogs. So I'm a big fan of prairie of bison. I love them. There's, there's, a big, there's a big push underway, I'll tell you, a little plug, to make bison um, the national mammal of um, North America. Uh, we are behind it in my organization. Um, I really like bison and prairie dogs. So, so I'll tell you, my kind of career trajectory is big blackfoot of ferret guy. How do you recover blackfoot of ferrets? Well, I realized pretty quickly we, I need to start doing prairie dog conservation work. So I started doing prairie dog conservation work. And I realized pretty quickly, boy, people hate prairie dogs. So I said, how can I recover prairie dogs more easily? Bison. If I can recover bison, people, not everyone likes bison. A lot more people like bison than prairie dogs. We get bison out there, they do really well with prairie dogs. And we get prairie dogs, then we get ferrets. <laughs> so, so I'm a big bison promoter right now. Um, Let's do one more question. I was just going to ask you that question. Okay. Last question. Well, how do the bison operate on limited land space, you know? I mean, the yeah, you just have fewer of them. I have a limited land. They still rotate on a ranch. And so I have, um, I just have, one area. I just have 1,300 acres, which probably sounds like a lot here, but in the east, it's, it's nothing. And so on that land, I have about 14 bison. I have no cross fencing. I let them manage themselves. That's how you do bison. That's why... What I'm saying is another thing, another discussion point I have with ranchers when I talk about management for biodiversity is this idea of shifting to bison. Not only do they do better with prairie dogs, but they're a lot easier to manage. You need a lot less labor when you just have a perimeter fence, number one, to maintain. And number two, you don't have to move the cows every few months to new pastures. The bison do it themselves. They move all over the place. They are really mobile. I mean, my bison are mostly in the prairie dog colonies, but they use the whole property all the time in a day. And so cows don't do that. They'll settle down in an area and they'll just, you know, mostly the riparian area, and they'll just use it. Bison will use the riparian area, but they'll, they won't stay there. They go right out of it, too. So um, it's, just, it's just a matter of numbers. Smaller land, less bison. 
So again, thanks very much for uh, bearing with me. And I really encourage you to, to watch this presentation by Khan. It's awesome.